Sue and Miss Faye. It's really encouraging when you come back. Um, I do not take your, um, please know I never take your attendance lightly. And as promised, uh, this morning we began looking at the second virtue or the manifestation uh, of the Holy Spirit in our life through the fruit of last Sunday. We looked at joy, excuse me, love, and then this morning we began uh, looking at joy. And uh, it's, um, um, I guess you, it's very safe to say, um, I try my best to do uh, what's called expository preaching, and there's different methods of preaching. Uh, everybody preaches different, um, but I guess you would say, uh, I do not claim to be an expositor of the word. Don't, don't, please don't, <laughs> please don't misinterpret my words. But I give it my all to be an expositive preacher, meaning that I look at the text and pray for the text to come alive. And then through the power of the Holy Spirit, I share with you what the text says. I don't add the meaning to the text. We never add meaning to the text because the Holy Spirit's already done that with the inspired word of God. Uh, when you when you deal with the fruit, basically, I don't know why I'm sharing any of this with you, but when you deal with, uh, say, for example, the fruit of the Spirit, what you end up doing is doing topical preaching. You take a, a subject and you are basically allowed at that point in time, uh, in a sense, you 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 go or you go through the word um, uh, through the word um, and bring that meaning to the word or the topic that you're discussing. Uh, it's kind of the same way with with characters in a sense of the Bible. Um, I, I don't know how much harder I can preach um, what I'm trying to. Uh, help us to understand so we can benefit as individuals, which is going to allow us to benefit uh, as a church in this community. I don't know when it's going to happen, but at some point in time in the near future, that blinking caution light is going to be taken down because of the, 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 the work that's being done. Um, that blinking caution light, uh, depending on which way you're traveling, uh, that blinking caution light, I reckon it's caution all the way around, isn't it? But anyway, it doesn't matter, rabbit, um, um, uh, um, is an icon in this church, uh, excuse me, in this community. Uh, you talk to people and they'll say, you're the church at the blinking caution light. Well, I'd rather them say, uh, you know, there's a blinking caution light at your church. It's your church that we see. Y'all understand what I'm saying? Uh, we should be a steady light that burns for the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, so uh, to, to, tonight I'm going to finish, for lack of better words, finish my sermon with you uh, talking about the fruit of the Spirit is uh, joy. The fruit of the Spirit is joy. And if you have a copy of God's Word, I pray that you already turn to Galatians chapter 5, uh, verse 22. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. Now, as I'm doing with this series, uh, if you would, please go ahead and find Proverbs chapter 15. Proverbs chapter 15. <coughs> Proverbs chapter 15. This morning we dealt with the one major truth that joy, looking at the fruit of the Spirit, that joy is not happiness. Uh, happiness is based upon everything that is external. What is going on, what is happening uh, around us, where joy is that of not dealing with what is going on uh, externally, but what is going on internally, not only internally, but also eternally uh, within our life. So joy is not happiness, and it was my prayer that we unpack that this morning. Tonight I want to share with you two other truths out of the, dealing with the fruit of the Spirit is joy, and that is simply joy is healthy. We're going to look at tonight that joy is healthy, and then thirdly, keep it in context with the sermon, uh, thirdly, we're going to look at that joy is heavenly. Joy is healthy and joy is heavenly. And in Galatians chapter 5, looking at verse 22, the Bible says, But the fruit of the Spirit is, say it with me, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Proverbs 15, please, verse 30. Proverbs 15, verse 30. If you're there, say amen. amen. Bible says, The light of the eyes rejoice 
the heart, excuse me, the light of thy rejoices the heart, and a good report makes the bones healthy. Daddy, would you ask for God's blessings, please? Amen. Last week I was at Brunswick Funeral Service. I had stopped by there to talk with Miss Connie about something. And uh, while I was in the funeral home, I got a phone call. There was a service going on out in the cemetery out front. And the person on the other end says, are you, at the, are you inside the funeral home? I said, yes, I am. They said, well, somebody out here that wants to see you. I said, okay. So after a few minutes, I noticed when the graveside service, the portion of the service was over at the graveside. And I walked out there and I said, who wants to see me? And they said, he does. So I walked a little bit away, and I knew who it was that wanted to see me once they said that. And it was uh, one of the Catholic deacons from St. Brendan's. His name is, we call him Deacon Bob. Uh, Deacon Bob is a dear friend of mine. I haven't seen him uh, probably in 10 years uh, because just prior to leaving the funeral home, I was the director that handled the, the, the services for his wife, Miss Ann. And uh, I, I made my way. Uh, he had on his vestments and everything. He, I, I thought he'd actually retired. And uh, he was doing the, the, uh, the graveside portion of the service. And, uh, I, and I walked up to him and I said, hey, Deacon Bob. And he's an elderly man. And I said, hey, Deacon Bob. And he turned around and he just looked at me and he smiled real big. I mean, Rhonda don't even do that. But uh, he smiled real big. And uh, he said, Jason, he said, how long has it been? I said, I'm not real sure, sir. I said, but it's good to see you. And uh, he says, uh, I just, he said, man, it's so good to see you. He says, uh, <laughs> he said, you look the most relaxed I've ever seen you. <laughs> I said, oh, Deacon Bob, stop. <laughs> I said, really? He says, yeah. He says, how are things going? I said, yeah, the boy, they're going. Uh, but, uh, you know, he didn't have a clue about college. But uh, anyway, you know one thing, uh, joy is healthy. Uh, when we concentrate only what's going on externally, uh, that can sometimes bring us down. It's what, that is what brings the worry and the wonder uh, and on the anxiety. And as Max Lucado, the word that he kind of, kind of used the other night a couple of times, it's the angst of life sometimes that really, that really gets us. But when it comes to joy, I'm not speaking about happiness, sir, man. I'm speaking about the joy of the Lord. When it comes to joy of the Lord, uh, it is absolutely healthy for us. Uh, if you know anything about anxiety, if you know anything about stress and wonder and worry uh, and all that that comes along with it, you will sooner or later you will have some cardiovascular issues you're going to have issues with blood pressure uh, you're even going to have gi problems you're going to have uh, uh, headaches uh, uh, you're going to have trouble sleeping uh, when you concentrate on what is happening when you're not focused on uh, uh, when you're not focused on joy that's why the bible says in proverbs 15 30 the light of the eyes rejoices the heart and a good report. And what does that good report mean? I, 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 that, that simply means the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. The, the good And a good report makes the bones, notice that, we're going to come back to it a little bit later, makes the bones healthy. Do you know people that are joyful? I'm not asking people that are happy, but right now, do you know people that are joyful, that have the joy of the Lord? I enjoy being around the people that have joy, amen? I really like being around those type people. It's almost uh, sometimes just witness, before, uh, just being truthful before you, before with you before God tonight. Uh, sometimes I'm envious of people that have joy of the Lord because I'll let sometimes I'm just being. It's hard. It's a struggle to preach this sermon this morning and tonight. Sometimes uh, I had to get prayed up and repent uh, because you know one thing you need to do is practice what you preach. Amen. Uh, I, and, I, and I'm getting ready to share a personal story with you just to be transparent with you tonight. But sometimes I'm right envious of people that have the joy of the Lord because and it helps keep me focused when I'm around those people and they'll, they'll encourage you. They'll, they'll, they'll do all kinds of things just to encourage you. And I uh, got a question for you. How often do you smile? As I said this morning, some of you, you're saved in your heart, but you haven't told your face yet. Uh, you know, how often do you smile? I want you to think about something for a moment. How often do you smile? And when you do smile, how long do you smile? Some of y'all have never smiled. Some of you have never smiled. 
And we've, we've got something to smile about. Now, understand this. Joy of the Lord is not smiling because the joy of the Lord goes deeper than the smile. The Bible says it penetrates the bones. It goes deeper than the smile. There's this, uh, there was a world record that was set. Uh, I don't know who set it, but I know who broke the record. And it was a little girl by the name of Lisa Lester. And she broke the, the record for smiling the longest. Uh, uh, it was 10 hours and 5 minutes. She never broke her smile. Broke the, in the Guinness Book of World Records, never broke the smile for 10 hours and 5 minutes. We're doing good if we smile 5 minutes throughout the day. I'm not beating you up. I just want you to understand some things about the joy of the Lord. Matter of fact, the record that she broke was 7 hours and 35 minutes. But how often do we smile when we're in the presence of other people because of the joy of the Lord that is within us. We used to say during COVID when we wore the mask and everywhere we went, it's hard to see people smile. No, it's not. I don't have any problem seeing somebody smile with a mask on. Because you know what you can see? You can see it in their eyes. You can see the squint, the, the, uh, uh, the, the, what's the word? The, the wrinkles, uh, you can see the wrinkles tighten up, Myra. Uh, 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 the squinting, sorry. The, you can see the squinting. That's why the Bible says the light of the eyes. Uh, you, can tell, you can tell when people are not smiling if they had a mask on. But whether we have a mask on or not, people ought to see it. I'm not, going, I'm not saying walk around all the time with some fake smile like a Cheshire cat. I'm just saying people ought to see us smile because of the joy of the Lord that's within our heart. It's in our, it should be in our bones. It should be penetrating. I referenced Dr. Ted Trailer this morning in a, a, a something I did. I, I don't think I did it at all at the 11 o'clock service, but at, uh, at, at Cherry Grove at the preaching conference, uh, Brother Sonny, you'll probably remember him talking about this. Uh, he said there was a young man that was saved at his church some 25 plus years ago. His name was Adidas, Ad, Adidas Cherry was his name. And Adius was the type, was the person before he came to the Lord that struggled with drugs, that struggled with alcohol, that struggled with so many vices and addictions. And then God miraculously saved Adius. And because of Adius' lifestyle, he was not able to get a job anywhere. And Dr. Trailer hired him at Olive Baptist Church in Pensacola, Florida. He said, All I want you to do is clean the church. He says, you're going to be one of the janitors here. It's a large campus. You're going to be one of the janitors here. He said, and after Adius came on staff as a janitor, he said he was absolutely the worst janitor that we've ever had. He said he never did what he was supposed to do. He never cleaned the toilets. He never took out the trash because Adius was in the hallways and the walkways of the church that everybody that come in throughout the week on Saturday, on Sunday, he was in the hallways telling them about Jesus and how he got saved. Do you know what it was? The joy of the Lord was in Addis' bones. And, and Dr. Trailer tells the story. He told it at Cherry Grove. He, tells, he told us, he says, Addis, you got to clean these toilets. He said, Pastor, what's more important, souls or toilets? It was, are we like that? No, we're not. No, we're not. Where is the joy of the Lord that should be penetrating our bones? We'll, we'll, we'll go to other things. We'll, we'll depend on other things. Why do you think the Bible says in Proverbs 7, 20, 17, 22, a cheerful heart is good medicine, but a crushed, listen to this, a crushed spirit dries up the bones. What, what's the, we, we, we just established that when the light of the eyes based upon the good news, it makes the bones healthy. Uh, the joy of the Lord. But yet, even though a couple chapters later, the, the, the author tells us that, that, that laughter, the joy of the Lord, is like good medicine to us. But yet a crushed spirit, that spirit that is dealing with and only focused on the things that are happening, the things that are external, not focusing on what, in, what is internal as a child of God with the Holy Spirit living within you that's dispatched and deposited the fruit in your life. You, you, you're only focused on what is going on, the, uh, going on around you on the outside. So that crushed spirit, what does it do? It dehydrates the bones. So what, how's our bones doing tonight, y'all? How's your bones tonight? 
I will tell you, uh, I've always been, I've always been wound extremely tight. It seems like I've always had stressful jobs. Revco wasn't that stressful, okay? When I was in high school, I had three jobs when I was in high school. I painted, I worked at Revco, and I pulled drinks for cheer wine. I'd get up on Saturday and Sunday mornings, and I'd run and I, I did four. They gave me four grocery stores around this area, and I pulled drinks for cheer wine and sweets ginger ale. And I'd get up early, and I would do that. And then, uh, because you had you had to be at church, hey, somebody say amen. Yeah, you had a mom and dad too, didn't you? Uh, I uh, I got up early. You remember that, Dad? I'd get up early. He don't marry sleep. Uh, I'm kidding. Uh, I'd get up early and I'd go pull drinks, especially on Sunday morning, so I could be at church on Sunday. And, and then uh, a little bit later on, I, I worked at Joy. Uh, worked at Joyce. I worked at Jones Ford with Miss Joyce. Miss Joyce was my boss. Uh, if my math is right, it's a, it was. A, I worked there eleven months because what they didn't know is I was trying to get on with the county. And Miss Joyce, and I don't know if I've ever said this, I, I pray that I've told her. If not, here it goes. Uh, Miss Joyce was the best boss I've ever had. The very best boss I've ever had. And working at the Ford place was a stressful job because a Chevrolet place doesn't have that much service. Anyway, um, <laughs> it was a, but you mess with somebody's vehicle, they're going to get you told pretty quick. Amen? Okay, when it's not ready on time. I've seen, her, I've seen her cry in her office before because of the stress of the job. I mean, and I was just a little service advisor. And I leave there and I go to 911 and funeral service and now pastor. About eight years ago, I remember something happening in my life. And it just tore me up. And I went to the doctor and, and I sat there to the, at the doctor and I just, I just cried. I couldn't say anything, I just cried. And she says, you need a pill. I said, that's what you think. So I started taking that little pill. And things got no better. That pill didn't do one thing for me. I was still wound tight. That's why I said, have y'all noticed there's sometimes I get real emotional at the drop of a hat. I know you think I'm probably a crybaby. But I tell you what, when I'm preaching the word of God, Sometimes if you've ever, I don't know if you've ever preached or not, but there's sometimes when you're preaching the word of God, what the word of God does to me sometimes is overwhelming and I can't help but weep in front of a holy God. I'm not apologizing. I don't think I'm a crybaby. Sometimes it gets overwhelming up here. But it didn't work. And I went back to the doctor, and I still sat before that doctor, and I cried like a baby again. And you know what they said? You need another pill. So they gave me another pill. That didn't do a thing for me. I went back a little bit later. I don't know why I'm sharing this. Probably think less of me. But just hold on. They gave me another pill. I was on three antidepressants. It's wonder I didn't walk around in a coma. And about, that was about 15 years ago, sorry. About eight, about eight years ago. Be patient with me, okay? Before I was even your pastor, I'll never forget, I was in my vehicle, I could tell you where I was at. And the Lord spoke to me in my heart. And I got under deep conviction about that medicine. And he said, Jason, why are you relying on appeal and not my promises? In other words, he was saying, my joy is healthy. And I took myself off those pills, and I don't recommend anybody doing it the way I did it. But I didn't ask nobody to go on them. I wasn't asking anybody to come off of them. 
Now, I'm going to say something. If you're on it, this is not a guilt trip. I'm, don't take what I'm saying wrong. This is a personal testimony that I'm allowed to give. If it works for you, praise God. But I got under deep conviction. The joy of the Lord is healthy. There is promises after promises after promises in the Word of God. I don't have a problem with people on medicine. I really don't. I, not at all. I don't mean this, but I don't care if it's working for you. But what I do have a problem with is people abusing medicine. What I do have a problem with is people uh, taking and using alcohol and drugs, recreation, prescription. I do have a problem with that. And here's why I have a problem with that. Because some people don't think that doesn't hurt anybody. Let me tell you something. Alcohol and drugs and prescription medication has hurt more lives than anything else. And the other side of the coin is that is that we don't think about or realize sometimes is that innocent lives get hurt because of it. Why do you think the Bible says that wine is a mocker and beer is a brawler? Proverbs 21.1. And the Bible says, not Jason, the Bible says whoever is led away by them is not wise. Why do you think Proverbs 23 says, don't look at the wine while it's red and glistening in the glass? And it goes down smoothly, but you just wait. Because it'll bite like a snake and it's poisonous like a viper. Any addiction. And Jeremiah 33, 6, if you want to write that down, Jeremiah 33, 6, I hung my fingernails in. Bible says, God speaking, I will heal my people and let them enjoy abundant peace and security. Sir, ma'am, the joy of the Lord is healthy. Not only is the joy of the Lord healthy, the joy of the Lord is heavenly. Let me ask you a question real quick. Do you think that, I'm just let's just us talk for a moment. Do you think Jesus was an easy person to be around? Do you think he was an easy person to be around? Do you think Jesus ever smiled? Now, these are unique questions. We, maybe we don't think about stuff like this sometimes. <clears throat> oh, but I do. I think he was a very easy person to be around. I think Jesus smiled. There's an artist that only does pencil drawings of Jesus smiling. I don't know if you've seen that work or not. But let me tell you something. When you look at Jesus in the Bible, why did children run up to him? Why did women adore him and men follow him if he wasn't easy to be around, Miss Patsy? I think it was a joy to be around Jesus. I think it was a joy to be in the presence of the Lord. Even though Isaiah 53 paints him as a man of sorrow. And you got to think about that. Y'all okay? Okay, four. All right. Why does Isaiah, Isaiah paint him as a man of sorrow? A man of suffering is what the Bible says in Isaiah 53.3. I'll tell you, it's because of what he was going to endure, Mr. Rick, on the cross. That sorrow and that suffering. Y'all remember Hee Haw when those four men would imaginary drink from that jug and they'd sing gloom, despair, and agony on me? I don't, uh, hey, I don't think Jesus act like that, but the problem is a lot of Christians do. And we shouldn't with the joy of the Lord that's within us. Matter of fact, if you think Jesus walked around sad, I would love for you to turn with me. We're going to navigate a little bit in the Word of God before I close. Hebrews, please. Hebrews chapter 1. Turn there with me, please. Hebrews chapter 1. The author of Hebrews is talking about Jesus. He's painted this prophet, priest, and king with ink. In Hebrews chapter 1, look at verse 9. If you're there, say, I am. The Bible says, talking about Jesus now, in verse 9, the Bible says, You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you. Is your Y capitalized? 
it needs to be, uh, has anointed you, watch this, with the oil of gladness more than your, yours capitalized, or where it should be in the Word of God, uh, with the oil of gladness more than your companions. In other words, sir and ma'am, Jesus had more joy than anybody you'd ever met before in your life. Jesus had joy. All of the time. Where did Jesus get this joy? Say it with me. God the Father. He got, now stay with me. He got the joy from God the Father. And what allowed His joy to remain throughout His life, throughout His legacy, and throughout His ministry? What allowed the joy to remain in Jesus Christ? And we're going to see how it uh, remained with Jesus through Scripture. Uh, how did that joy remain? I'll tell you why. We're going to look at three things to understand. It's real quick. Don't think. Uh, we're going to look at three things to understand how Jesus' joy remained. And the Spirit that was in Jesus and the joy that was in Jesus is the same Spirit that's in us, and it's the same joy that needs to be in us. So if it worked for Jesus, it needs to work for us. Somebody say amen. John chapter 4, the gospel of John chapter 4. Turn there with me real quick. John chapter 4. I want us to look at the woman at the well for just a moment. I want us to look by that, and I want to show you something in Scripture that's pretty awesome to me. Uh, uh, John, the gospel of John chapter 4. John chapter 4. Are you there? All right, look at verse 27. I want to pick up in verse 27. Uh, Jesus has, uh, uh, had, had, is getting ready to, uh, to do something pretty, pretty awesome here. Look at this. He's, at the, uh, he's been with the woman at the well, and he's told her to, he's got something that she can drink from a well that never runs dry. I mean, look at verse 27. And at this point, his disciples came, and they marveled that he talked with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you seek? Or, why are you talking with her? I've always loved verse 28. The woman left her water pot. She didn't need her water pot. Do y'all get that? She didn't need her water pot. Isn't that, isn't that good? Uh, the woman left her water pot, went her way into the city, and said to the men, Come, see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. In the meantime, his disciples urged him, saying, Rabbi, eat. They were worried about Jesus. He'd been ministering, and they said, Rabbi, you need to eat. Now watch what he says in verse 32. But he said to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. Huh? Where's this food at, Jesus? Do you have a little, a little bread cake or something with you? He says, I have bread to eat that you do not know. What, is, what does he mean by that? Well, he tells us in verse 33, Therefore the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him anything to eat? Who brought Jesus something to eat and didn't tell us? Look what he says. Look what, are are y'all okay? In verse 34, Jesus says, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. In other words, Jesus is saying, I'd rather do the will, be in the will of God and do the work of God than eat when I'm hungry. That's my food. That's what moves me. That's what drives me. He says, I've come. What did he say? He says, I didn't come to be served. He says, I've come to serve. We all know John 3, 16. John 3, 17 says what? John 3, 17, that Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but that through him, others might be saved. He says, I've come for salvation. I've come to say, I've come to seek the lost. And Jesus enjoyed nothing. When you look at his life, y'all, when you look at his ministry, he enjoyed nothing more than coming in contact with the lost. Why do you think we have the three parables of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost brother? Or the lost son, excuse me. Do me a favor, turn to Luke 15. Real quick, we're almost finished, I promise you. Luke 15. Luke 15. It's in the New Testament. Luke 15. Luke 15, look at verse 6. This is the parable of the lost sheep, but look at verse 6. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me. In other words, have joy with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. Look at verse uh, 9 in the parable of the lost coin. Right there below it in verse 9, 59. And when she had found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I have lost. Look at 15, 22 about the prodigal son. But the father said to his servant, 
servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put the ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry for this my son was dead and is alive. He was lost and now he's found and they began to rejoice. Do we have a passion for the loss? Let me tell you something. You want your fire lit? Witness to somebody in the name of the Lord. Witness and doing the work of the Father of what we've been put on here to do. Not only does uh, joy affect our will and the work of God, joy also affects the witness of the believer. Do me a favor and turn to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. Oh, I've already done. No, I haven't. Luke chapter 10. Joy affects our witness. We're right there together. Luke 10, if you're there, say I am. Watch this now. Look at verse 1. 10, one. And after these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. And then Jesus goes into talking to them about the harvest is plenty, but the laborers are few. Would you please look with me at verse 17? This is going to be so cool. You're going to be so glad you came to church tonight when I share something with you. In verse 17, look what the Bible says. Then the 70... Re Mm. Then the 70 returned with what? Joy. Saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Ooh, what power? But Jesus tells them, he says, be careful with your power. And now he talks to them about their pride. In verse 18, he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on servants and, uh, serpents and scorpions and all over the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits... Uh, are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. You know what Jesus is saying right there, sir, ma'am? He's saying witnessing my name is something. Witnessing my name is powerful. But what you need to be concentrating on is that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Concentrating on the lost. Concentrating on the lost and salvation. But watch this, verse 21, we're not over with. This is the cool part. Look at verse 21. Don't tell me Jesus was a man of sorrow and walked around with his lips pooched out. Look what it says in 21. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced the joy of the Lord. He rejoiced in the Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them to babes. Notice what he's saying here now. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows who the, who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Then he turned to his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes Y'all heard anything about the eyes before tonight? Blessed are the eyes which see the things you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see what you see and have not seen it, and to hear what you hear and have not heard it. The light of the eyes rejoice in the heart. The witness, the work, the will, and also and lastly, joy is and comes by Jesus through the way of the cross. Would you turn with me pretty please back to Hebrews chapter 12. Looking at the life of Jesus. Hebrews chapter 12. Joy is heavenly by the way of the cross. Don't vote, don't raise your hand, don't look at your neighbor. Y'all ever get weary of being a Christian? I'm not asking, does it get bothersome? I'm asking you, do you get tired sometimes? <laughs> the 
feel like sometimes you get beat up. You feel like sometimes you're not worthy. You feel like sometimes you don't study enough, you don't read enough, you don't pray enough. I was talking to two men yesterday, and I just shared with them, I said, I missed y'all at church. And one of them said, uh, do you really mean that? I was like, yes, sir. He said, it's not a guilt trip. I don't operate on guilt trips. And guess what? Neither does Jesus. But I do have a question for you. Have y'all ever been persecuted like Stephen? Have you ever been persecuted like Paul? Have you ever been martyred like any of the disciples? You ever hung on the cross like Jesus? Even all the way to the cross. Do y'all know Jesus did that with joy? Jason, how can you say that? Because it's in the Bible. In Hebrews 12, verse 1, the Bible says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Watch this now. I like this. Looking unto, say it with me, Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now for this truly to make sense, we have to remember that Hebrews was written to people that were persecuted. Hebrews was written to the Christians that had left Judaism. And any time suffering came along for the Christians that had left Judaism because the Judy, uh, Jews, Judaism believes that if you suffer or you go through something pretty rough, it is because God has denounced you. And that's why Hebrews was written to those Christians of Judaism. And the author was saying you need to hang on. You need to cheer up. And by the way, Christian, the Christian life is a race. Amen. It requires discipline. It requires endurance. I was talking with Allie Smith the other day, and she's thinking about wanting to play soccer this year and lacrosse her junior year at West. And her main concern is she had knee surgery in eighth grade from playing soccer and lacrosse. And I said, Allie, I said, do me a favor. If you decide to play, and her mom and dad told her the same thing. I says, if you decide to play, would you please do me a favor? Don't just run out there at the first practice. You need to start running and getting condition, conditioning that knee because you ain't played in a couple years. Y'all, we need to run the race and condition ourselves through the word and through prayer. But Hebrews 12 also tells us that we need to get rid of the hindrances. I've never seen a runner run with a pair of boots on. I've never seen them run with their belt and their wallet and their watch and all this stuff. My daddy, when he was a lot younger, got thrown out of a boat one time fully dressed. My dad will get in the water, but I will tell you there's a phobia of water even in my dad's life today because it's hard to swim when you're fully dressed. It's a lot easier when you just have on your trunks or your bikini or something out there swimming. So what's holding us back, church? I'll tell you one thing that'll rob your joy, and that's the sin that's in our life. We need to repent of our sin. You don't have to turn there, but I just thought of something. Y'all are very kind and patient. When David got caught with Bathsheba, Nathan went to him. You know the story. 
And David penned Psalm 51 about his sin with Bathsheba. You don't believe sin will destroy your witness? Listen to what David said. We know this verse. David says, restore to me, God, restore to me the joy of my salvation. And uphold me with your generous spirit. But then listen to what David says in the very next verse. Then I will teach transgressors your ways. And sinners shall be converted to you. He says, Lord, get rid of my sin. I repent. I'm sorry. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. There was a lady that after 40 years of marriage, she was widowed. And she was all alone in the home. She'd sit in her chair with the blinds closed. One day she decided to go to the pet store. And she looked around in the pet store and nothing seemed right until this parrot she was looking at seemed right. And it was expensive. And she looked at the store clerk and she said, does he talk? As a matter of fact, he's got a wide vocabulary. He's actually a chatterbox. He would be great company for you, ma'am. She says, okay, I'll take him. And she buys this large, spacious cage, kind of luxurious cage, and she carries him home. He don't say a word. She goes back the next day. She said, Barrett's not, talk not talking. No. Huh? said, did you buy him a mirror? said, no. said, well, the bird's got to have a mirror because he'll look in the mirror, see the other bird in the mirror, and he'll start talking. She buys the mirror, goes home because the bird didn't say a word. Goes back to the store the next day. Not talking. Did you buy the mirror? Yeah, I bought the mirror. Would you buy him a little ladder? No. Well, he's got to have a little ladder because he goes up and down the ladder. Then he looks in the mirror and he starts talking. She bought the ladder. She went home. Bird didn't say a word. Went back the next day. He said, that bird still ain't talking. I said, no. I said, did you buy him a swing? I said, no, I didn't buy him a swing. Well, he's got to have a swing because he gets on the swing, he'll hop off the swing, go up down the little ladder, look in the mirror, and he'll start talking. She bought the ladder, went home, well, bought the swing, went home, didn't say a word, went back the next day. That bird not talking? Nope. He said, you buy the bell? She said, no, I didn't buy the bell. He said, we got to have a bell. He'll hit the bell, it'll ring, he'll run up down the little ladder, get on the swing and swing, look in the mirror, and he'll start talking. She buys the bell. She goes home. Y'all be patient. Next morning, she wakes up. The bird's dead. She runs back to that pet store. And she tells him, she says, that expensive parrot that you bought me is dead. He said, you're kidding me. I said, I can't believe it. She said, I know. I bought the bell, bought the ladder, bought the swing, bought the mirror. She said, by chance, did he say anything before he died? She said, yeah, listen very close. And he did say something. The bird said, what did he say? He said, the bird said, did they sell any bird seed? <laughs> you see, I said that to say this. You'll enjoy it more as the night goes on. <laughs> Sometimes we just focus on the external of what we need or what we think we need. But what got where Jesus received his joy from and where we need, I'm not asking us to think morbidly, but I am asking us to think clearly about joy. As Hebrews chapter 12, the Bible says, Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Do you know why Jesus endured the cross with joy? Because of what was on the back side of the cross. And that was the resurrection. So I'm going to ask you a question. As the musicians come. Now y'all stay with me. Did Jesus receive the Holy Spirit? Yes. And it came from where? Where? The answer is the Father. 
So Jesus receives the Spirit from the Father. Now don't, don't try to get theologically on me. Just listen. He received the Spirit from the Father. The joy that Jesus had in Scripture came from the Holy Spirit, right? Jesus had joy. Came from the Spirit. The Holy Spirit that we have at the moment of salvation comes from the Father that was sent in the name of Jesus, right? The Holy Spirit that was sent to us at salvation that came from the Father in Jesus' name brings us the fruit of joy. Amen? So if Jesus got joy from the Spirit and we got joy from the Spirit and it's the same Spirit, my question is, is our joy the same as Jesus's? The invitation is, is it? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the joy. The joy of salvation that we have. And so, Heavenly Father, I pray that even now, we continue to ask the question and look around and ask him what is fulfilling our life. And where is that temporary happiness coming from? Because it's just temporary. But tonight, Lord, may we look at the will and the work and our witness and the way of the cross tonight. Lord, if there's one here that doesn't know your Savior, and Lord, I pray tonight that their sal is the night of their salvation. And Lord, if there's one here that doesn't have the joy that you give us, I just simply ask, Lord, that they spend time in prayer. Maybe they want to come to the altar. Lord, I just want us to get it. So will you help us? It's in Jesus' name.